Good morning, ladies. Welcome. Come on in. Find your seat. Grab a yummy snack. It's good to be here. Would you stand and would you sing with us this morning? We are coming back to that new song we sang last week. And I love it so much because I often think when I go through a trial, how would I face this without Christ? Right? I wonder, how do people do this without Christ? And yet, with Christ, our firm foundation, we can face anything because of him. And so, let's sing this out in worship and praise to him this morning.
We can lay everything down, our burdens, as it says in your word. We can put them before you, knowing, God, that you love us more than we can even understand and knowing that you have the power and the sovereignty to be in charge of what's going on in our life. And so, God, we just thank you for being a wonderful, amazing God. We thank you that we can know you through your son. We thank you this morning that we can worship you together. We pray this all in your son's precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, ladies. Welcome to our Tuesday morning women's Bible study. It's such a beautiful day, and it is wonderful to be here this morning with you. Well, as we announced last week, we have a very popular event coming up very quickly. In fact, this Saturday, the 20th at 9 a.m., we have tickets going live for our Women's Spring Tea. And this is a limited ticket event. It goes very quickly. So you want to make sure that you set a reminder for yourself on your calendar, your phone, however it works for you, to get onto compasswoman.org or onto our Compass Church Center app at signups and then you look for the T, be ready at 9 o'clock with that ready to go so you can just hit the button and get your tickets for that T. Another popular event that is coming up so quickly, it's hard to believe, but we are at Hot Topic almost. This is coming up on April 30th and May 1st here in Women's Bible Study. Now, Hot Topic, for those of you who might not know, is when our director, Stephanie Schwartz, brings something from our culture that is just a really hot topic, aptly named, and she breaks it down for us through scripture, and she makes sure that we have the tools to take that topic out and have discussions and have discernment with God's word as our filter. We love to guess what the topic might be, but she loves to make this a surprise, and we are so excited to find out this year what we're going to be studying April 30th, May 1st, here at Women's Bible Study. Our speaker this morning is Heather Pace. Heather is married to Pastor Lucas. She is busy with six adorable kids at home and then even has time. She's an amazing writer, if you didn't know this about Heather. She has a blog called Truth for Women, and the four is numerical, if you're looking that up, Truth for Women, where she takes the idea of being a woman, being a mom, being a wife in this society today, and how can we do that looking at scripture where we're pleasing God? And her topics are just amazing. I love reading what she writes, how she breaks it down in a very simple way so that we can fight what the enemy and what the world is constantly telling us about our role as women. She is a very familiar face. You'll know she's taught us many times here at Women's Bible Study. And every time we walk away just blessed with practical application that we can put into practice right after the lesson. So let's get prepared ourselves and let's pray together as Heather comes up to teach us. Lord, we are so thankful for this beautiful day, for the women that are here today, for the fellowship, for your word. We thank you for Heather and all the time that she has put into preparing this lesson for us. And we pray that we can just listen, be still, and that we will um, take this into our groups and have God-honoring conversations. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, over Easter break, um, my family got away to the desert for a few days. And because we have a large family, as you know, we took two cars. And so I had half of the crew. I had the two toddlers in the back, and I had my oldest in the front, and it was a lovely drive in between the chaos of toddlers. I don't know if you've done that in a while. It's not a blast. You know, there's the fighting and the needs, and you're throwing things back there and all that. But amidst all that, I was having some great conversation with my oldest in the front. It was some very deep conversation. She asked me, Mom, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? And that threw me off because I haven't thought about superpowers in a really long time. So I had to have her list them off for me. What are the superpowers, Bailey? Tell me what they are. So I don't know if you remember what these are. Uh, Let's see, there's walking through walls, there's flying, there's time travel, there's teleportation, and there was a few other ones. I had no idea what to pick. And so I'm stalling, so I ask her, well, what would you decide? 
and she wanted to teleport. I figured her out. She wants to teleport so she can go hang out with her friends whenever she wants to. Typical teenager, right? Um, I was very boring. I said, how about can I be the smartest person there ever was? She's like, Mom, that's not a superpower. And so we debated back and forth about whether that was a superpower, whether it'd be a good superpower. The thing is, is I was trying to come up with a superpower that had like real value, like real life value. Clearly, I was taking this hypothetical question way too serious, but it was interesting to think about when we had a long drive. So I'm thinking, okay, well, flying, I mean, that's fun, but that has no real value. Walking through walls, um, that doesn't help anybody. Teleporting, I mean, I guess I could teleport to different places and I could evangelize or something like that. And so, you know, I'm thinking hard, trying to figure out what are these powers, which one of them can really benefit people and make a difference. I came up with no good answer. Well, a few days later, I'm studying James chapter 5. And all of a sudden, that conversation came back to me. Because as I'm reading the words that James has in this text, it just jumped out. We Christians basically already have a superpower. In fact, James uses those words. He says, great power. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. And that's not anecdotal power, right? Because we have this example in the text of Elijah who prays that it will not rain, and God hears him, and God answers, and there's no rain. And then three and a half years later, he prays that there would be rain, and then it rains. That is great power. As the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon put it, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the arm of omnipotence. Our prayers may not be that mighty. They may be a little like that slender nerve, but they are mighty when they can move the massive arm of the almighty God. And the more we learn about prayer in scripture, the more that we see that that is exactly what prayer does. When we pray, God works. But the question is, do we access this power? Do we utilize prayer as if it actually works? God wants us to. He wants us to know that when we pray, he is listening and he is ready to act. So let's turn to this text, James chapter 5. As you know, it's verses 13 through 18. And hopefully this passage will leave us motivated to pray more often, more fervently, and more expectantly. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18 reads, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Can you hear me? You can't hear me, can you? Testing, testing, testing. There we go. All right, I'll start back in verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. What a great passage on prayer. But if we're honest, if we really thought about this text, there's probably a handful of questions that come up as we read a text like this. I mean, this is a text that has been misunderstood and misapplied throughout the years, especially as we get to that, the middle part of the text, verses 14 through 16, there's all kinds of questions we could ask. Um, there's talking about sickness. What kind of sickness is this? Is this person really just healed all of a sudden? Um, is it physical healing? Is it uh, spiritual healing? They anoint with oil. What's that all about? There's this prayer of faith. What does that mean? I mean, what is sin and forgiveness? What does that have to do with all of this? 
There's a lot there. But even if we didn't get any of those questions answered, there's a very clear point in this text that whatever happens in life, we should be praying about it. If we are suffering, we should pray. If we are cheerful, things are going well, we should pray. If we are sick, we should pray. We should be praying for each other. The bottom line is we need to pray no matter what is going on. So point number one, I said it like this, respond to the ups and downs of life with prayer. The ups and downs of life, we see that clearly in verse 13, both of them there. First, there's the situation of suffering. That word is a very broad word. Uh, It could be any kind of hardship. It could be emotional, physical, relational. You're stressed, you're overwhelmed. Any kind of hardship, how are we to respond or to pray? And it's an imperative. It's a command. You ought to pray. You must pray. And then on the other hand, if anyone is cheerful, if you're doing well, maybe not things are going well, but you're doing well, you're happy, even you're handling your trials well, praise the Lord. And that's another aspect of prayer, really, right? Because prayer is taking our thoughts and directing them up to God. And so it's taking a certain kind of thought, a grateful thought. You're praising God in your thoughts and you're sending that up to God, another form of prayer. And this also is in the imperative. So if you are doing well, you must praise God. You ought to go to God to thank him. And both of these are in a tense that means we keep doing them over and over again. Through all the ups and downs of life, we should be going to God in prayer. So let's just camp out there for a moment. Before we dive into all the different questions of this text, what is it really saying? Let's just think, do we really, truly go to God in prayer no matter what is going on? Is that our default position to talk to God? Because I can think of so many other things that are tempting to go to. Uh, We can go into fix-it mode when things aren't going well. How can I take care of this? What can I do? Or we distract ourselves when things are hard, when we're truly suffering. We, you know, there's things that take our mind off of what we're going through, whether it's our screens or whether it's food or whether it's shopping, or even if it's just friends, which can be a good thing. But do we go to God? Do we turn to him? I recently saw how the everyday anxieties of life are somewhere, are a time in my life in which I should turn to prayer, but I don't do it as automatically as I should. I saw this when I was doing something I'm sure none of you have ever done, but I am frantically looking for a receipt because I have two days to return all this stuff, and if I don't return it, I'm going to lose a bunch of money. Not the biggest deal in the world, but not a great thing, right? I don't want to lose a bunch of money pointlessly. So I'm frantically looking for these receipts, all the different places that it could possibly be, Usually looking in places, what, like 10 times? You know, I've already looked there, but no, it's got to be somewhere. So I'm having all of these feelings. I don't know if you'd call it anxiety. I don't know if you'd call it frustration. Whatever you want to call it, what it was not was prayerful. And I'm thinking, why am I not praying about this? I mean, of course I could pray that God would help me find the receipt. That would not be hard for him at all whatsoever. But to pray that I handle this well, right? that I keep perspective in this situation, that I get through this very minor little thing in a way that pleases God. Why am I not going to God in prayer? And so I stopped and I prayed. And In God's kindness, I got that perspective. I had the peace that I knew that I needed to have. And in his double kindness, I remembered a place that I hadn't looked under my bed. And there it was in the bag that I thought it was in under the bed. And you'd think that would teach me a lesson. It was probably two hours later where I all of a sudden get a text that messes with my plans. I thought the night was going to go a certain way, and then a text comes in, and it just throws me for a loop. How am I going to do all this? How am I going to you know, do the different places, get it all done with the littles? How is this going to work? And I start having that feeling arise again. Thankfully, God reminded me much sooner, pray. Pray about this. I mean, God is king over my schedule right? He is king over all the plans of all the people who are involved in this. If he wants to change it, he can change it. But he can certainly get my heart at peace. He can give me perspective. This is just a night, right? Even if it all goes terrible, it's just a night. And I can pray about these things. And again, in God's kindness, before I even was done praying, I got another text that changed it all. And I saw, okay, God is in charge. Why do I not pray more often 
about the little things of life, but when you think about it, though these things are little, my heart's response is not little. I am either trusting God or I am not. And it very much shows by how often I come to him in prayer with all the things that are on my mind. And this, of course, is true of the truly big issues of life, the real suffering, the real loss, the real heartache. When we are suffering, we should pray. Look at verse 13. It really is as simple as that. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. It doesn't tell us how much to pray. It doesn't tell us what to pray. It doesn't tell us how to pray. It doesn't tell us what the goal even is of this prayer. I mean, of course, we learn in Scripture a whole lot about prayer. But right here, James just wants us to think, I need to go to God. When something is wrong, when I am suffering, when I am struggling, I just need to go to God. It's a lot like what toddlers naturally do when they get hurt. They skin their knee or they bump their head or whatever. Who do they go to? They want to go to their parents, right? Usually it's mom. They want up. They just want to be held. It's like they instinctively know who they depend on, so they don't have to be taught this. They just want to go to mom and to be held. We should go to our father. We should instinctively depend on him. Know that he knows what we need far more than we will ever know what we need. And just go to him when we are struggling. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have when we're cheerful, when things are going good, we should be truly giving him credit. And there should be no lack of that in our lives. James chapter 1, as you know, says that every good and perfect gift is from above. And so we should see that all over the place, all the good and perfect gifts that God has given us. And there are seasons, I'm sure, that you've experienced where it's especially marked by the goodness of God whether it's babies being born or people getting married or people getting saved, where it's just all around you. And we should see that when we are in those seasons, that it should be marked by more praise and thanksgiving to God. And if it's not, there's probably something wrong in our thinking. I don't know if it's that we would feel entitled to the good that God has given us and we're not giving him the credit. We think that we've done something. If we're just being forgetful, whatever it is, we have got to train our minds to thank him. This, of course, is where toddlers are not a good example because you could give them the best gift that they've ever received in their entire life, and they will take it, and they will run the other direction without even looking you in the eye, much less a thank you. And we have to teach ourselves, like we should teach our children, to look the direction of the giver, and say, thank you. We do not want to be toddlers in our thinking when it comes to the goodness of God. Whether things are good or whether things are bad, let's make sure we go to God more. And that's a fairly general goal, but James starts getting more specific as the passage goes on. So let's look back at our passage. We'll untangle it a bit before we go to apply it. Let's look at verse 14. He asks a third question. He asks if anyone's suffering. He said, is anyone cheerful? And now he says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So let's start there and just think through those last words. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. What's that about? We clearly have a sick person, and then he's starting to talk about sin. And what we do see in Scripture is there is times when those are interconnected. There are times when our sin can cause sickness. That's not the norm. Typically, we have sickness because we have the fall, right? Things are messed up, and so we do get sick, and we eventually die. But James is leaving room for the possibility that if you find out when you are dealing with sickness that it has to do with sin— then you should confess that, you should ask for forgiveness, and you should repent, and you should know that God will forgive you. And then verse 16 continues with that idea of sin in the community. Uh, Really, if anyone finds sin in their heart, so 
Verse 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So it's like James is saying, speaking of sins, God forgives. So confess your sin, pray for each other. And it's not just the elders that need to pray. We should all be praying for each other. We all have that ability to come before God and to pray for each other. So the first thing we see in this text is there's a really, you know, especially spiritual side to it, that there's sin and there's forgiveness. And we can miss how amazing that is. I mean, just to start right there, that through prayer, we can change the debt that we owe, right? We have something against God and God forgives us just by praying. I mean, that itself is a miracle. But then there's also this physical reality that the text is speaking to. Uh, There's this physically sick person. It seems like this person is fairly sick. In verse 14, it says that the elders should come and they should pray over this person. And the elders is just the, the spiritual leaders, the church leaders, the pastors of the church. And they're to come. So that's implying that the sick person isn't able to just see a pastor, you know, in church or in the community and say, hey, will you pray for me? The sick person needs the pastors to come to where they are. So that tells you something about the level of sickness. And then praying over that person implies that that person is lower. So likely on a bed or on a mat. So you have this fairly sick person that the church leaders are then anointing this person with oil. Of course, we don't do that today, typically. And so the question is, what does that mean? There's several different interpretations, but none of them are crazy and mystical. Uh, One of them is simply the fact that Oil was often used medicinally back then. And so oil was used for all these different practical purposes. You had the elders who were respected members of the society. They would be trusted to administer these oils, to bring them with them, and to help the sick person. And so in other words, pray for this person, you know, trust God, but use a little medicine if you need to, right? Or use whatever is necessary to help the person medicinally. That's fine. Or another way that the oil is sometimes um, explained is It's more of a symbolic thing. In the Old Testament, you would set people aside with oil. And so in this sense, the elders are coming and in a tangible, in a visual kind of way, they're setting this person aside for God's special care. God, we are praying for this person. And that could serve as as an encouragement to the people that they are being set aside to be prayed for. So either way, uh, you know, not a big deal either way. We're not told to anoint people with oil as we pray for them throughout the New Testament. It's not something that's a huge deal to apply. Uh, But the main thing to notice is it's not power in the oil. The oil is done in the name of the Lord. It's he who has the power to heal. And that's where verse 15 goes. Look down at verse 15. It says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. So in other words, as these elders are praying, they're trusting God. That's the prayer of faith. They're trusting God to answer their prayer, and God heals. The person gets better. They are, they're raised up. They're able to get up and get going again. So depending on your background, there's a couple different ways that you could take all of that. Historically, there's been many who get really excited about that. And they're like, we want to see people raised up, right? We want to see people healed. And so they start having rallies and conferences, and they try to get people healed following this as much as they think that they can. But I want you to notice a few things in this text. Specifically, notice whose faith is being talked about in the prayer of faith. As you read the text, you see that it's the elders of the church who are praying over the person, and then it says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. So whose faith are we talking about? We're talking about the elders' faith. They're the ones praying. It's them trusting God as they're praying to heal that person. That's a lot different than what you see today, where you see a lot of people coming and being told that if they just have faith, they can be healed. And so when they are not healed, it's their fault, right? Because they didn't have enough faith, which of course leaves a lot of people disillusioned thinking, what's wrong with me? I thought I had faith and I'm not healed. Also, it's interesting to notice that when you think of the elders, the leaders of the church, there's many passages that explain the qualifications that it takes to be an elder. Not one of them is the gift of healing. So though this text is saying the elders come and they have a prayer and this person is healed, 
nowhere is there an assumption that an elder has that power, that an elder has the ability to heal on a whim. So in other words, when you bring people together and assume that someone can be healed because someone has that ability, that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing the godly men of the church pray to God, trusting God for whatever God's going to answer, right? We're not expecting God to do what we want him to do. We're trusting God with what he says is best, and James is saying, and they can be healed. Notice also that this is not a big ordeal, right? This is not a big show. This is not trying to get the masses together to watch people get healed. This is in someone's home, that the pastors are coming to them, trusting God and praying. Very different than what you might hear going on in the world today that you might even be invited to. Just come. You can get your headaches healed. You can get this healed, and someone can heal you. That's not what we see going on in this text, and I think you'll see that more as we continue to look at the passage more clearly. But some of us don't read it in, that ter- in those terms, looking for a miraculous healing. I think many of us look at it a little bit more critically. Like, hmm, is this really healing we're talking about? Is this actually physically healing that God ever does? And the answer is yes. Always? <laughs> well, no, right? Because people do die. And James clearly isn't expecting that every sickness is going to be healed because we live in a fallen world and all of us are going to one day face death. So, of course, not every sickness is going to lead to healing. And the day that God has determined for us to die, there is no prayer that is going to change that. But there is a sense in which there are times in life when we are weak and we are struggling and we should get other people to pray for us. And physically, if we are sick, we should get people to pray for us. We should get the godliest people we know. We should get our church leaders to pray for us and to trust that if God wants to heal us, he absolutely will. And then we might ask, why don't we see this that much? You might think of Elijah's example as we read it in the text, and you think, well, wait, Elijah prayed that it would stop raining, and it stopped. Elijah prayed that it would start raining, and it started. That is not how I see prayers for healing going nowadays. I just don't see that. Well, let's look at where this account is found in 1 Kings 18. And I think we will see in there more clearly how God often answers our prayers. So 1 Kings 18, we're going to look at this story of Elijah praying for the rain to stop and the rain to start. Elijah, uh, in 1 Kings 18, is giving you the context. It's the people of God not worshiping God as they should. They are worshiping idols and because of that, they are going to, they are experiencing a form of judgment in a drought. And as James tells us, Elijah prayed for the rain to stop. He prayed for this drought to start. And this went on for years. But at the end of this drought, the people did repent. They realized they were wrong and they started worshiping God. And so then Elijah prays again and the rain comes back. So that's where we're picking up in the text. So 1 Kings 18, let's start in verse 41. It says, and Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So in other words, he's saying, king, go celebrate because the rain is coming. He's confident, right? Okay, now verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and winds, and there was a great rain. So picture that. Elijah is fervently praying for there to be rain. So he sends his servant to go look and to go see if there's rain. The servant comes back and says, there's nothing. Prays again, fervently praying. He tells the servant, go look, go see if there's rain. There's nothing. A third time, nothing. A fourth time, a fifth time, 
And finally, at the seventh time, eventually, there's a little cloud, described as a little cloud like a man's hand rising from the sea. And then more time passes. And then it says the heavens grew black. Now that sounds a lot more like our experience as we pray for the health of the people in our lives. We're praying, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. And then we see a little glimmer of hope. And then we're praying and then we're praying and we see a little more hope and we're praying and we're waiting. And then we finally see God's answer. Outside of the miracles of Jesus and his prophets, the times when God is authenticating his word, these unique times in scripture, it's different. But other than that, that's pretty much how we see God working as we pray for healing. Not to say that God can't heal instantly. Absolutely, he can. A hundred percent, he is able. But we are not giving him enough credit if we are not looking at the times that he heals over time as we are praying and saying, God did that. God healed that person. If we are not looking at the times when we prayed for somebody to be healed and they are still here today, if we aren't giving God credit for that, we are missing it. God healed that person. Even if the person didn't pray for healing, even non-Christians, they are experiencing the common grace of God who made our bodies in the most amazing way to heal. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, that God is the one who heals all your diseases. So the question shouldn't be, does God heal? Of course he does. The question is, do we pray like Elijah? Do we trust that God is listening and that he will answer? And of course, Elijah's circumstances are different than ours. He heard God. He heard his voice audibly. He was one of God's prophets. So yes, It is a different situation that he had. But look what James wants us to see about Elijah in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So really, he wasn't all that different. Elijah just prayed, and then he trusted God. Any Christian can do that. And no doubt, we all need to do it more and do it better. We need to pray, point number two, pray with an unquestioning trust in God. When we are sick and we are praying, we need to trust that God hears our prayers. When we're praying for our loved ones, when we're praying for the problems they are dealing with, when we're praying for their health, we need to trust that God hears our prayers. When we're praying about anything, about our children's salvations, about the the trials that we're going through, about direction that we need, about open and closed doors. We need to pray with an unquestioning trust in God, even if we're praying and we don't think we see an answer. If we're praying for the third and the fourth and the fifth, even well past the seventh time, and we are not seeing anything happen, it doesn't mean God, is, God isn't listening and it doesn't mean God isn't working. I heard someone compare prayer to a Chinese bamboo tree. I don't know if you've heard of how these things grow. It's quite interesting. You first place the seed in the ground as usual. You water it. You fertilize it. A whole year goes by and nothing happens. You come back the second year. You water it. You fertilize it. Nothing happens. Third year, same thing. You take care of it, water it, fertilize it. Nothing happens. Fourth year, same thing. Sometime during the fifth year, this tree will grow 90 feet in three weeks. It would seem like nothing was happening all along. And yet whatever needed to happen microscopically is exactly what was happening. We might be thinking our prayers are falling on deaf ears, but who knows what God is doing behind the scenes? Who knows what he has planned? Who knows the dramatic difference that your prayers are going to make all of a sudden? The tree owner needed to trust the process, and so do we with prayer, but we have something much greater than trusting the process. We are trusting God 
himself. He is good. And if what you ask for is good, you need to trust that your Father is not withholding it from you. Matthew 7, 11 says it well. It says, if you then, who are evil, right, you're, you're sinful, you're nothing like God, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? When it seems like God is withholding good from you, it is because what you think is good is not as good as what God thinks is good. Paul illustrates this well. Let's look at a passage I'm sure you're familiar with, 1 Corinthians 12. We actually see a specific issue of health that is being prayed about. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We see that Paul is pleading with the Lord, to take away this physical problem he's having, this thorn in the flesh. Many people think it's the problems with his eyesight. That would seem like a really good thing to be asking God to take care of. I mean, you can imagine, Paul, he is going hard for the Lord. And I'm sure whatever problem he has is slowing him down. It could be discouraging him. It's making him feel weak. I mean, it is causing problems in his life. So that is a good thing to ask God to take away. But when Paul realized that God said no to his pleading, he recounted what he learned. Let's look at verse 8. It says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God was teaching Paul something, and that was better than him being problem-free. What I wonder is, would our trust match Paul's if we were put in his shoes? If God told us no, would we be able to like Paul, say, I can be content in this? Or would we question him? "Ah, God doesn't really know what he's doing. Or maybe we would just think, is this even God's answer? I mean, is God even answering? Do we even have trust like Paul to plead with the Lord, expecting that he hears us and expecting him to answer us? We need to pray fervently, knowing that the Lord hears, whether he says no, like he did to the Apostle Paul, or whether he says yes, like he did to Elijah. We need to trust that prayer actually works. And I don't mean that prayer works in that it changes us, although that's true, right? That's a beautiful benefit of prayer, but that's not what I mean. I don't mean in that it lines our hearts up with God's will, that it makes us more holy as we pray, although that's true and that's good. What I mean is when we pray, our Father is listening and he is ready to act for our good. And he is good. No doubt it is all a big mystery how prayer works. I mean, the fact that we have a sovereign God who is working out his plans and he's going to do it whether or not we pray. And our prayers, I mean, he doesn't need us, right? But yet somehow he tells us that our prayers are effective. He has worked it out, ordained it, so that our prayers actually matter. And we see that in the Old Testament. We see people are praying, they are asking, and God is working. He's working out his plans through the prayers of his people. And then as we get to Jesus and the Gospels, we see the way he teaches his disciples. And it's very much a mentality that you should ask God and you should expect that God will answer. As you go out and as you minister, know that God is going to answer your prayers. And then as we get to the epistles and we are told the things that we should pray, it's very much with an expectation, prayer works. God is going to answer us as we pray. Prayer affects change. And if we just took that one, only that one truth to heart, I think that would dramatically change how we pray. Rather than that 
I don't know, that ho-hum mentality where we have these lists, whether it's on some app on our phone or these lists on, in front of us, and we just kind of go through them not thinking that we have the ear of God and he is ready to do something because of the words that we are about to say, that should cause us to come to him with a bit more enthusiasm. And it would probably stop us from questioning, how long should I pray? You know, asking questions like that, where it goes from a responsibility a bit more to a privilege, where it's no longer, how much do I have to pray? But we want to pray because we have the living God listening to us and ready to answer. And that would probably cause us to be more focused if we really thought about that. Just even if we thought deeply about prayer for just a moment, it would cause us to want to focus more. And no doubt, it is a battle. Every single one of us could say, man, it is such a battle to keep my mind focused where it should be. But think a bit about prayer and then realize how worth it it is to battle. I mean, we really got to know it is worth the fight. We should be more enthusiastic. We should realize it's a privilege. We should focus more. We should also pray for bigger things. It's like we have a wallet with an endless supply of money, and we are content just going to the 99-cent store and buying the little stuff, some of the little stuff that won't even last for very long. But we're happy, right? We got all this money and we're getting the stuff that we want, the little stuff. How much more should we think big? What could we buy with money? What good can we do? And we are spiritually so very wealthy. And yes, we should pray about the little stuff. We absolutely should. I mean, if we're talking to God all the time, we naturally will pray about all of the little things that come up in our life. But we should be thinking bigger. What could we pray for that would affect all of eternity? That we will praise God for, for all of eternity because of things that we all prayed for. Not just pray that our kids grow up in certain ways or, you know, succeed in this way or succeed in that way, but they are great for God's kingdom, that they make a massive difference in this world. Who does God want to save around you that you should start praying for? What history could be in the making that you could be a part of because you prayed? Let's think big in our prayers because our God is powerful and he is able to do all kinds of things as we pray. Let's think of things that God would want to do and let's believe that he can. Let's pray better. Let's pray bigger with more trust in God and more expectation to see him work. Not certainly the thrust of this passage, but there's another truth implied in these verses that is worthy of imitating. It's seen in the expectation James has in the way the church is supposed to interact. So real quick, look down at the text and you just see the way that this church is interacting. They are calling on the elders. They are confessing their sins to one another. They're praying for each other. And just to really sum it up, point number three, let's pray with God's people more often. Needless to say, we see it in the text, we are not meant to do the Christian life alone. Right away, we see this in the early church, Acts 1.14. The church is just getting started, and it says, with one accord, they were devoting themselves to prayer. And it continues that way throughout Acts. They are spending time praying together. And Paul, as he's writing the different letters, he's often saying that he and the people who he is with are praying for the churches, and he's not afraid to ask for that prayer back. A couple of good passages, Romans 15, 30. Romans 15, 30 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. And Ephesians 6, 18, Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. This is just what Christians do. They pray for each other. They strive together in prayer. And as you picture this, it's not these vague, you know, routine-like prayers. There's this closeness, this intentionality. There's this reliance that you see just in this text. I mean, this reliance when they are at their weakest, they are getting the leaders of the church to be praying for them. But also think that they're confessing their sins to each other and then praying for each other. 
This is likely referring to the way that they've sinned against each other. So that right there says something, right? That they're living life close enough that they're sinning against each other. And then they are humbly coming before each other and confessing that. Saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. They're making it right with each other. And then they're praying together. I mean, that's a closeness that's at a whole different level. Sometimes, is it possible that we keep each other at a distance a little too much? We should be pursuing holiness together. We should be seeking God together. We should be relying on each other when we're going through struggles, when we're going through trials, when we are sick. We should be letting people know, letting people in, asking for prayer. We should stop the whole, I don't want to be a burden nonsense. And we should be there for each other. We should come alongside each other, especially in real fervent prayer. And that's got to be one of the best ways that we can love each other to really have someone take the time to focus and to pray for you, whether it's with you or apart from you. In God's providence, I had a friend who showed me this exact love while I'm studying this passage. She randomly texts me out of the blue and says, I'm committing for 10 minutes of every day this week to pray for a few friends, and this is what I'm praying for you. And then she just lists off a bunch of things. And the next day, I get another fat text of all these things she's praying for seven days. She's praying for things I haven't prayed for myself, and I don't know how long. We don't show love to each other like that often enough. But what a beautiful trend to start. Start it. Pray for somebody like that this week. And hopefully she'll pray for somebody like that this week. I mean, what if that went around all month long and we were encouraging each other by praying fervently for each other? It's so easy to just say a little prayer so we can text and say, I prayed for you, to check it off the box. But let's really love each other and really pray thoughtfully, intentionally. Let's not be too busy for this most important work. Let's take something off our plates if we are too busy to pray for each other. And if we pray more for each other and just pray more in general, we will be different if we do. There's a hymn that expresses this well. The the writer was a man who went through some hard times. Uh, He was an upstanding guy, had big aspirations. We fell in love with a woman who's going to get married to her. They were engaged. The day before their wedding, this woman is riding on a horse on a bridge. She falls off of her horse into the water, and she drowns. And He is heartbroken. So he tries to make a new life for himself. Uh, He's wandering around. He's working for no wages, serving the poor and the, the widows around him. He's tutoring children. Eventually, he falls in love again. And before his wedding, his fiance gets pneumonia, and he dies. He dies. He was known to be very discouraged and beat down by these tragedies. But at some point, he wrote a hymn. He actually wrote a lot of hymns. He had a book of them. But this one was different. This one was more personal, more simple, more casual. He sent it to his mother to encourage her when she was sick. And it's likely that she's the one who made this hymn known. This is how it reads. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there written by a man who needed a solace. He needed comfort. He needed hope. And where did he find it? He found it in prayer. Through God, but in prayer. Prayer is the lifeline we've been given. In it, we have direct access to the living God. And he wants us to come to him, whatever we are going through, through all the ups and downs of life, And when we do, he wants us to be confident. Confident that he is good and that he wants to act for our good 
and that he is able. And because of that, we should pray bigger. We should pray better. We should pray with more zeal, with more focus, with more thoughtfulness. And we should pray more expectantly, ready to see our prayers be the slender nerve that moves the arm of omnipotence. Let's talk to God now. God, I thank you. Thank you that you give us access to you. I thank you that we know that you can hear us, that we have that confidence. I pray that you would give us that confidence on a very practical level, that we would know that as we talk to you, that you are listening. God, I know this is just one tiny facet of prayer. Your word teaches us so much about prayer that we should learn and we should apply. But God, I just pray that the truths in James would change us, that they would make us want to come to you more, and that they would just give us a sense of your power that we have access to as we talk to you, that you are ready to act for our good. God, we do trust that you are good. We know that you are not going to just give us whatever it is that we want if it's not good. You're going to give us what is good. And so even when we don't understand that, God, we choose to trust in you. But God, help us to be encouraged as we pray. Help us to see your answers even this week. I pray that we would pray more, pray more for each other, and just pray more in general to you, the living God who is listening. In Jesus' name, amen.